All right. Praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to begin today in John chapter 3. John chapter 3 of the New Testament. I love the book of John. John the Beloved. And everything that we pretty much are going to hear today are the words of Jesus. Amen. Kind of a red letter edition here today. John chapter 3 in the New Testament, beginning with verse 1. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one else can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. We must be born again. He says, so what does it mean to be born again? How is one born again? This confuses Nicodemus. He doesn't quite understand. And what is the evidence that one is born again? What is the evidence? It actually means, born again actually means to be born from above. Amen? Amen. Born from above. And that's the title for today's message. We're going to talk about being born from above. There you go. <laughs> And so let's open in prayer and put this before the Lord in prayer and pray for his presence with us today. Heavenly Father, hallelujah, I thank you for this word you've given me. I thank you, Lord, that you've given me the opportunity to preach your word. Lord, that I not preach from my flesh, but by your spirit. I let your spirit have control today, Lord. Hallelujah, control each and every day. But Lord, I pray for your presence. You speak through me today. That I not speak from my flesh. Let your word come through me and let it land on the hearts. Anoint me that I may preach and anoint them that they may hear. All who listen, I pray, Lord, that this word be rooted in their hearts. And I ask for your blessing. And I ask in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. amen. Praise God. John chapter 3. Here, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. Why he came by night, not sure. Doesn't really say. Maybe he just didn't want to be seen hanging around with this Messiah as he calls himself. So it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews. He's no dummy, okay? This guy should be well versed in the Word of God and the Word of the Almighty. He's a ruler of the Jews. Not only was he a ruler of the Jews, he's one of the richest men in all of Judea. One of the richest men in the world. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Nicodemus is speaking for the Jewish leadership here. He says, we know. He didn't say, I know. He says, we know. They recognize that this guy had to come from God. This Jesus guy, we don't know exactly where he's a son of a carpenter. Okay? He's a peasant. But he put the, the stuff that he's teaching and he's preaching, the things he's doing, he's raising the dead, he's the blind to see, the lame to walk. He had to come from God. He acknowledges this. He acknowledges, he hasn't acknowledged he's the Son of God, but he acknowledges you must have come from God. God must have sent you. And some might say he came to trick Jesus. I don't believe that. He came to trick Jesus. He said, you must have come from God. You must have been sent from God. And some people, he's trying to trick Jesus and say, I'm the bread of life. I am the Messiah. I am He. But if that were the case, Nicodemus would have brought what? Two or three witnesses with him. Nobody's going to believe on one person's word. So he's not here to trip Jesus. Nicodemus simply came to Jesus out of curiosity at this point. He's curious. He's seen what Jesus can do. He's heard the things. 
and he's curious for and Nicodemus says for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him and what Nicodemus is saying here is no one I have, we have never seen anyone do the things you're doing Jesus nobody's ever been raised from the dead no man has ever been given his sight no man has ever been cured of leprosy the lame have never got up and picked up their bed and walked. You simply speak it to the, to the centurion and his, his son was healed. If I'm telling the story correctly, his servant may have been. But what I'm saying is that Jesus simply speaks it and things happen. Amen. No one can do these things. But by Nicodemus' words, he desires to know more. He wants to come beyond the curiosity. Because curiosity, let me tell you, curiosity, I've, been, I've seen it a lot in the church. And uh, if you've been around the church long enough, you see it. People come in here because they're curious. They come in for one or two Sundays and out the door they go. They're just curious. They really don't want to know everything. They're just curious. He's going beyond curiosity now. He wants to know more. But Jesus answers him. He cuts to the chase. Jesus answered him and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, this is truth Jesus is telling here. He's not making this up. He says, truly, truly. He doesn't say it once. He says it twice. This is important. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What does it mean, you cannot see the kingdom of God? It means you cannot comprehend the kingdom of God. You can't wrap your head around it. You, what I'm telling you, Nicodemus, isn't even going to make sense to you because you're not born again. You're not saved, Nicodemus. And it's, you can't comprehend what I'm saying. And that's how the world is out there. They don't understand why you're sitting here today listening to what the preacher got to say. That makes no sense to them. It's foolishness. They can't comprehend why you would want to come into a church and hear what one man has to say and then give money in the offering plate. To them, that's foolishness. They can't comprehend. They can't see it. Their eyes have been veiled. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Makes sense. I mean, that's the natural. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus ain't getting it. He doesn't understand. He's like, how can I be born again? I remember, that just came to my mind. It's not even in my notes. I remember hearing a testimony once of a gentleman, I'll try to make it short, and how he came to know the Lord. And he said he went outside and went and sat by the pool out behind the house, and he sees a car pull up, and the gentleman gets out and starts walking towards him. And he's, he's sitting there, he's got a bottle of Bacardi and a glass. He's going to enjoy him a, a drink or two or three. And he's getting ready to pour that drink, and the gentleman comes walking. Oh man, he says, "Looks like an insurance salesman." And uh, he comes up to him, and he said, "We'll just—I can't remember the guy's name. Let's say his last name was Callahan." And he says, "Mr. Callahan, can I have a word with you?" He says, "Sure, go ahead." He says, "I'm from the First Baptist Church where your children go to church at." Oh, he said that. That Bob Bacardi was about six foot tall at that moment. <laughs> he, said, he says, this is no place, no time for a preacher to come up talking to me. Well, no, it was the right time for the preacher to come up talking to him. And he says, I just want to ask you, I just want to speak to you for a moment. And he says, well, hold on. Mr. Callahan says, let me tell you something, Mr. Preacher. He says, you see that truck sitting out front of the house? That brand new truck. He says, if I want to come to your church, I'll get in my brand new truck and I'll drive to your church. But I don't want to go to your church. My kids can go to your church, but I have no desire. He said, is that why you thought I was here? 
He said, well, that's what you do, right? He said, no. He said, I didn't come to invite you to church. Church ain't going to help you, none. And he felt insulted. He said, man, I'm that bad that church can't help me? He said, let me ask you something. He says, Mr. Kelly, when was you born? He said, July 4th, 1949. He said, oh, wow. You're born on the 4th of July. Everybody celebrates your birthday. And he said, well, I guess so. Some do, some don't. He said, yeah, that's a great day to have a birthday. He goes, but when were you born again? What do you mean? Born again? I told you I was born July 4th, 1949. How can I be born again? <laughs> he says, you don't know when you got born again? He goes, I, what you're saying don't make sense to me. I'm not, I, I, I can't be born again. I was already born. <laughs> and as it goes on, basically, the preacher said, did I have to read something here in John chapter 3? He opens up his Bible. Mr. Callahan looks at it and he says, unless you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. He said, Mr. Callahan, you understand what that means? It means if you're not born again, you're not going to heaven. That kind of hit him pretty hard. He said, man, I don't be born again. I'm not going to heaven, which means I'm going to hell. And the preacher finally told me, he said, well, he says, I gotta go now. He says, uh, can I pray for you before we leave? And he says, yeah, you can pray, just don't pray for me. <laughs> he said, Doc, he said, Doc, God, it, he said, he prayed for me. <laughs> just did exactly what I asked him not to do. He said, and I went into the house and he said, Honey, I was sitting out here trying to enjoy me a drink of a party. Now I don't even want to drink. What happened? Oh, well, the preacher came over here and started talking to me about being born again, which I don't even understand. He said, but in the end he told me, I'm going to hell. He said, I feel like I just fell off the mountain right into the gates of hell. And he says, uh, I don't know. I'm confused now. A couple days later, I mean, it just kept weighing on him. Heavy. The Spirit of God is coming upon him, pressing in. And his wife said one morning, she woke up, she said, I know what our problem is. We need Jesus. <laughs> and she says, we need Jesus is what we need. That's our problem. He said, maybe you need Jesus, but I need another drink. <laughs> and he tried to pour another drink. And it just wouldn't work. He just couldn't bring himself to do it. And his wife went to church that morning. And she got born again. Praise God. She got saved. Praise God. Oh and she came home and told her husband. She got saved. And he said, saved from what? She said, I'm saved from hell's fire. And you need to come to church this evening with me. Oh, no, he said. I'm fine, right where I'm at. No, you coming. <laughs> and he went there. And he got saved. Hallelujah. Gave his heart to God. Amen. Amen. But the world doesn't understand this born again experience. And much of the church, I think, doesn't really understand the born again experience. What it means to be born from above. Is Nicodemus. Much of the church is like Nicodemus. The world is, obviously. How can he be born again the second time? Can he go back into his mother's womb? You know, in 1988, we were all alive then, right? And who was running for president in 1988? George Bush? The vice president, and uh, I think he was running against uh, what was his name? Doesn't matter. Anyway, <laughs> um, Vice President Bush was running to be the next president, 
And he had called ministers from around the United States to come to his ranch in Texas. And they all met in the dining room, you know, the big formal table, and they were all sitting around and they were talking and having conversation with President Bush, or future President Bush, at the time Vice President Bush. And finally one of the pastors spoke up and said, are you born again? And Vice President Bush said, I don't understand. What does that mean? He did not understand what it meant to be born from above. It's spiritual. The world does not truly understand the born again experience, the born from above. And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, once again, truly, truly, the importance of this, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so many people misunderstand that. Born of water, what does that mean? Unless one is born of water, this is not water baptism. And there are, a lot, there are pastors out there that think that. That have that confused. That is not water. Water baptism does not save you. If you get water baptized, hopefully you're already saved. It's an outwardly profession of your faith in God, being born again. It's not water baptism. Jesus explains this in the next verse. I'm going to read that one again. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He's saying born of water. Every one of us was born of water, right? The natural birth. You were in your mother's belly for nine months in a sack of water. You're born of water. That's what he says, born of the flesh, Jesus calls it. And that which is born of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is spirit. Do not marvel what I said to you, you must be born again. And it, and it literally in the Hebrew means you must be born from above. Every one of us was born a natural birth. Amen. We came into this world. We, I think we all understand how that came about. I don't need to get into the details of the doings of your mother and father. We, I think we all understand that. But we were all born from our mother. We were born of the flesh, the natural birth. We were quite comfortable, I think, when we were in our mother's belly. There wasn't no screaming and crying going on. We were probably sucking our thumb and and we were enjoying everything that our mother ate because it was shared with us, right? In the umbilical cord, we were, uh, when she ate pancakes for breakfast, we got a taste of that too. <laughs> we, and so we enjoyed everything that our mother was giving to us while we were in her belly. But the day came when we had to get born, right? We were going to come out of our mother's womb and make our grand entrance into the world. And what happened? There were birth pains. Your mother experienced a lot of birth pains. And as a result, when you came out, you experienced from the birth pain, you experienced what? What I call groanings. Every one of us came out kicking and screaming and crying. When my, when my twin date granddaughters were born, they cried for, screamed their heads off for 40 minutes until they lost their voice. I mean, literally for 40 consecutive minutes, they screamed. Why? I don't know. But we suddenly, we come out of our mother's womb, we're in shock. We don't know, and I know none of us remember it, okay? But we're in a whole new environment now. They cut that umbilical cord, like, oh! <laughs> Taking our food supply, we come, become totally dependent on our parents. But we come out crying. Sometimes it takes the doctor to slap us on our rear end, knock the wind into us, we start bawling and crying. Yeah. Us men did too. We cried. But uh, birth pains is described as a brief piercing spasm of pain known as the pains of childbirth. But what does it mean to be born of the spirit born, above, born from above? It's a different type of birth, though it is a birth, you're born again. Should there be pains or groanings in our spiritual rebirth? 
That's what born from above is. You're born from above, from the kingdom of heaven. You are born from above, from God. Should there be some pains or groanings? And just a few examples of spiritual pains can result in groanings. Uh, it's defined as a sharp attack of mental anguish. Also known as agony. I thought about that when I read that. Agony. As I was about to get born again, born from above, when I woke up that day, I felt agony. Agony because I knew I had lived a life that was not of God. I woke up that morning and something felt different. I didn't feel the same. I no longer was comfortable in my lifestyle. And God, the Spirit of God was pressing on me. And I didn't know how to deal with it. I was in agony. I knew that I had lived a horrible life of a sinner. And that was what God, it's not what God wanted for me. And then there's the pain or groanings of disappointments. All my disappointments and failures in life were coming to mind. I had tried to live a life that I thought was best for me. Uh, one disappointment after another, after another, after another. Trying to quench my thirst for the worldly things and it was never enough. There wasn't enough money in the world for me. <laughs> and I just, I knew that I had failed the Lord. See, I was called to be a preacher at age 11. Now here, here I was in my 40s. And I have not fulfilled what I told God. I promised God that I would do. And I felt agony. And I was all my disappointments in life. And uh, I want to talk about that. The pain of disappointments. As I was about to get born again that morning. I'll never forget that day. In John chapter 4. If you want to turn there, go ahead. Uh, I'll give you a second. We're going to read quite a few verses here. This is the story of Jesus as he was traveling. This has a lot to do with Jesus dealing with this woman's disappointments in her life. And uh, Jesus was a traveling man, he traveled all over. In verse 5, we'll pick it up. John 4, verse 5 says, Jesus came to a town in Samaria called Sikar, or as the Hebrew says, Suhar. And he approached Jacob's well. He was crossing the land that Jacob had given. And there was Jacob's well. And uh, verse 7 says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Jesus didn't, wasn't being disrespectful. He just simply said, give me a drink. In verse 9 says, And she said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. So, Jesus, Samaritan woman, Jews have no dealings. They don't even speak to them. And here's Jesus, this Jew, and he says, woman, give me a drink. And that kind of astonished her. She's a little surprised by that. Why are you speaking to me? And Jesus answered her, verse 10, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew the gift of God, but what is the gift of God? His son, Jesus Christ. His son would come and die for you. To wash you clean of your sins. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink. If you knew who you're talking to, lady, if you understood that I am He, the Messiah, I am the Son of God, the bread of life. If you knew who is saying this, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. Amen. If you knew who I was, you would have asked me for a drink, and I would have gave you living water. And the woman replied, verse 
verse 4, or 11, excuse me. Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? At this point, she's just like Nicodemus. She's curious. She's curious about what Jesus is saying here. How are you going to get water out of here? You don't even have a cup or a bucket or anything to drop down in there. The well is deep. You can't reach down that far. How are you going to get some water? And, he said, and she says, are you greater than our father Jacob? Who do you think you are? Are you greater than Jacob? And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Everyone who drinks from the Jacob's well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst again. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. The living water. There's a big difference. It's all spiritual. And the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Hallelujah. The water that Jesus wants to give you, if you allow him to come into your heart, it will be a well that will spring up from inside you that you will never thirst again. Spiritually speaking, and I hope you understand what I'm saying here. The things that you thirst for, the things that the world has to offer. When you were a sinner, I thirsted for a lot of things. I wanted a new motorcycle every month, and sometimes I did it. Okay? I wanted a new car, new home. I wanted all the things the world had to offer. And I could never quench that thirst. There wasn't enough money. There wasn't enough motorcycles or cars, any of that. It was never enough. I was always thirsty. And I see, I see people today, friends, doing the same thing I did. It could never quench that thirst for what the world had to offer. It was never enough. It was never good enough. And a woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. She's starting to get it. She's asking for that water. What is this living water that you have I want some of that, she says. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you're right in saying that. When you said I have no husband, you were right. Jesus is about to reveal her disappointments in life. She had no husband. For you have had five husbands, Jesus says. You're working on number six. A lot of disappointments in your life, huh? I've had five, you've had five husbands, and the one you now have, the one you're now living with, is not your husband. He's revealing to her that she's living in sin. But to notice that Jesus is not condemning her. He's basically stating her condition. He's pointing out the facts. The woman said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. She's starting to get it. Why does she call him a prophet? Because the Samaritans believed that when the Messiah came, he would be a prophet. Sir, I believe that you perceive you are a prophet. Now, here's where it gets good. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. It's talking about Mount Garrison. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. You, Jews, are saying we should worship in Jerusalem while our fathers worship at Mount Garrison. And she said she knows that she believes that ain't right. The Israel of old worshipped at Mount Garrison. But now you, you Jews have moved into Jerusalem. And what she's saying is, the Samaritans are much like the church of today, the modern church. Let me explain. Mount Gerizim. What was Mount Gerizim? It was 50 miles north of Israel. Mount Gerizim was the Mount of Blessing. The Mount of Blessing, that's where they worshipped. Because they wanted the blessing 
more than they did the one who blesses. God doesn't honor that. Okay? Much of the modern church is that way. The, the what, prosperity gospel, the greed gospel, where they focus simply on being blessed. They want that blessing more than they do the one who gives the blessing. Because right across from Mount Gerizim was Mount Ebal. That's where the worship was supposed to be. What was Ebal? The Mount of Cursing. Ebal is where Joshua built the altar. That's where you lay down your sins. That's where you come to the altar and praise God and ask forgiveness. That's where they, but the modern church, just like the Samaritans, they moved the altar to the Mount of Blessing. And Israel had moved it to Jerusalem. Nobody was going to Mount Ebal where they should be, where Joshua built the, built the altar. Lay down your sins at the altar. Ask for God's forgiveness. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither the, this mountain nor Jerusalem will worship the Father. What Jesus is saying is, there's going to be a new covenant. I'm putting. I'm going to abolish the law of Moses. And we're not going to have to worship in Jerusalem or at Mount uh, Gerizim or Mount Ebal. He says, you worship what you do not know. By them worshiping at Mount Gerizim, they don't even understand it. They're chasing after the blessing and not the one who does the blessing. And says, we worship what we know. He's speaking of the Jews here. What does he mean by we worship what we know? He's saying this, the word of the Lord was given to the Jews. The word of God was spoken to the Jews. They know the word of God. It was given to them. They were God's chosen people. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. He's not saying, Jesus is saying that unless you're a Jew, you can't go to heaven. It's not what he's saying. That salvation doesn't lie in Israel. He's saying this, that I am he. I am the one that was told, foretold. I'm the one that came out of Israel. I'm the Jew. I'm the Messiah. I came from the line of David as predicted. I'm the one Isaiah spoke of. Salvation is would come from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. How can one worship the Father in spirit and truth unless one is born from above? We must be born of the Spirit. It's a spiritual rebirth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. Understand, God is not seeking holy worship. He's seeking holy worshipers. That's what He wants. He wants holy worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The only way that one can worship in spirit and truth is to be born of the spirit. Be born again. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. They understood. The Samaritans understood that the Messiah was coming. He who is called the Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Isn't that what Jesus just did? He told her everything about herself, didn't he? She's starting to catch on here. She knew that when Messiah comes, he will reveal and tell us everything. And he told her everything about herself. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you and he. You're looking at it, honey. Okay? <laughs> I am the resurrection and the life. You're talking to the Son of God. And what did she do? She realized now she's talking to the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Hallelujah. So she left her water jar. She said, I don't need that no more. I'm gonna, I keep drinking that. I'm going to thirst again. He's giving me the living water. Amen. And I will never thirst for those things again. Hallelujah. She left her jar of water and went into the town and said to the people, Come see a man. Come see a man named Jesus. Hallelujah. Come see a man named Jesus who told me all things that I ever did. He's the Messiah. Is he not the Christ? What's amazing is 
the very first person to preach the gospel that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God was a woman, a woman who was a sinner. But God dealt with her on that. She went into the town and said, I've talked to the Christ. Come see him. His name is Jesus. And they went out of the city and they came unto him. Hallelujah. But you notice. You notice how Jesus revealed himself to the Samaritan woman versus how he revealed himself to Nicodemus. What did he tell Nicodemus? He said, what? You must be born again. He just cut to the chase. He said, look, you got to get born again, Nicodemus. And Nicodemus didn't understand it. And Jesus went on to explain to him. And Jesus also told him, he said, are you not a ruler of the Jews? Did not you study the word of the prophets? You should know these things, Nicodemus. If you had read the words of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah, you would know these things. Did you not read the words of Moses? You would know who I am. Why did he talk to Nicodemus that way? And he didn't talk to the Samaritan woman that way. Because Nicodemus, like I said, was the richest man, one of the richest men in all the world. He was a very noble man. What did Jesus say about, he said it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. The rich man doesn't want to let go of his possessions. He seeks the things of the world. But Nicodemus, if he had told Nicodemus and pointed out his sins like he did with the woman at the well, Nicodemus, being a man who came to Jesus clothed in self-righteousness, he was righteous, he was rich, he believed that he was blessed by God, and the evidence is that he was rich. He had everything he ever wanted. And he was righteous in his ways. He wasn't born again. He wasn't saved. If Jesus would have said, Nicodemus, you're a filthy sinner, you need to repent, you need to you get up your high horse, you need to come down here where I'm at, and you need to ask God to forgive you. You're a sinner, Nicodemus. Nicodemus would have got up and left. Because he was a noble man of self-righteousness. He didn't see anything wrong in his life. He was of the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee. Jesus had to deal with Nicodemus differently. He just told him the truth. You need to get born again, brother. <laughs> you need to get born from above. But how did he deal with the Samaritan woman? He pointed out her flaws, didn't he? He said, hey, you've been married five times, and the one you're living with right now, you're not even married to. you got sin in your life. But Jesus loved her. He gave her the truth. Why? Because she humbled herself and says, why would you even speak to me? I'm a Samaritan. She, didn't, she wasn't clothed in self-righteousness. She recognized that she had things wrong in her life. That's how we get born again, okay? If someone's never going to get born from above as long as you cannot see the things that are wrong in your life. Because that's self-righteousness. You want to see what self-righteousness looks like? Read the parable of the wedding feast. When it gets to the end, you'll understand She was humble. She recognized she didn't argue with Jesus. He knew that Nicodemus would never stand for being called a sinner. She had the pain of guilt and remorse. Repentance. She acknowledged that she wasn't right in her walk with God. She wasn't living right. And she knew this. What were the worst words that come out of Jesus' mouth when he began his ministry? He came out of the wilderness. He said, repent. Repent. That's the first thing. One must repent for one to be born from above. We have to repent and ask God to forgive us. Acknowledge the wrongness of our ways. And repentance is something that continues. 
It's not just one time. So all of us sin all the time. Whether we realize it or not, we need to repent. Even pastors. We have to repent. What does repent mean? Maybe some of you don't understand what repent means. Simply means that God is right and you are wrong. And turn from the direction you're going and go in the, in the right direction towards God. But recognize that he's right and your ways are wrong. Romans 10, Romans chapter 10, Paul lays it out about being born again, born from above. We wrap this up. It says, verse 9 says, Then if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And that's something that should keep going for the rest of your life. As long as you've got air in your lungs, you should be confessing the Lord Jesus as your Savior to others. Amen. That's how we fulfill the Great Commission. That's how we bear fruit. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart. In your heart, not here, but here, in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead. That God raised him, Jesus Christ, from the dead. You will be saved, Paul says. If you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, the Son of God, on the third day, and confess him in your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. This is not your righteousness. It's God's righteousness. For he is righteous. Hallelujah. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Praise God. Hallelujah. How many of us remember the day we got born again and born from above? I don't remember the exact day. I couldn't tell you. It was 2009. And the Spirit of God came upon me that morning. And I was fighting it with everything that I had. And I was feeling those birth pangs. Every disappointment of my life was before me. All my failures. All my sins started to weigh, come upon me as a, it was the burden of sin was weighing upon me really heavy that morning. God chose that day. This was going to be the day of salvation for me. And I don't know what your experience was like, okay, when you came to God and confessed Him as your Lord. And I don't even know, maybe some of you in here that aren't born again. Born from above. But I'll never forget that day. Not only did He save me, He baptized me in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise God. But you know, in John chapter 10, Jesus tells us the thief, the enemy, in other words, the devil, comes but to what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. The devil wants to steal and kill and destroy everything that you have. Everything in life. He wants to destroy everything you own. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy everything. And that's what he tried to do to Job. I remember Job. The devil came to steal, kill, and destroy everything he thought he had. He thought he had stolen everything from Job. His family. He killed his family. He stole all his livestock, all his possessions. Knocked down his, his uh, family's homes, blew them away. Like a tornado come ripping through there. Just destroyed everything. He even inflicted Job with something similar to leprosy. He thought he had stolen everything from Job. But the devil didn't understand one thing. Job's everything was God. Amen. Not his possessions. 
God was everything to Job. And he should be everything to you. If God truly lives in your heart, he's the center. He possesses. He holds your heart. He's the only thing that's in your heart. The center of your life is God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you should be. And the devil can't steal that, okay? He can't destroy that. He can't kill that. Because that's of God. He can't do that. He thought he took everything from Job, but he couldn't take God out of Job's heart. <laughs> Jesus went on to say in John chapter 10, he said, but I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And that's exactly what he did for Job. When Job went through that test, that trying period, when it was all said and done, God gave him back like tenfold of what the devil had taken. And not only that, but life eternal, abundant life. And every one of us should be living that abundant life. That's that resurrected life. Knowing that you have nothing to worry about. But I want to close today with a sinner's prayer. And, you know, because I don't know if every one of us are born from above. Maybe we're in that process. Maybe, you know, uh, I think we all come to God at different uh, levels. We come to God at different approaches. We can only come to God the Father through Jesus Christ, okay? We all understand that. And the only way you come to Christ is through the cross of Christ, what he did. But we all come at different speed, I guess, or different, uh, some of us take longer. As those pains and those groanings continue, some of us, the, you know, to me it happened one day, one morning I woke up, like I said, and those groanings, those birth pains, as I was about to be born again. And, uh, but the longer, the harder you fight it, the longer the process takes. And uh, eventually you're going to have to yield to His Spirit and allow the Spirit of God to come into your heart and live in you. And let that living water spring up inside you that you don't thirst for the things of the world. And so, let's, uh, if we can stand, if you can stand, let's stand. And when we say the sinner's prayer, I just want you to repeat after me. I was going to say it, however God lays on me to say this. Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Father, I know that I am a sinner. But I know that the answer is in your Son, Jesus Christ. For he bled and died for me. And I believe that you raised him from the dead. And that I could be saved by believing in what he did for me. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I believe that he atoned and paid for my sins. And he did that at Calvary. Where the devil was defeated. And now I am washed. I am cleansed. I am forgiven. I am saved. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Turn around and tell somebody today, when you go out of here today, tell them, I am saved. The Lord Jesus Christ bled and died for me that I may live forever in the kingdom of God. I am born from above. Amen. Praise God. All right.